Welcome to the Information Security Forum podcast. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert, and this podcast is the first of three episodes featuring ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin's interview with Scott Amix, Managing Partner at Scott Amix Ventures and author of the forthcoming book, The Human Race, How Humans Can Survive in the Robotic Age. So let's begin. And Scott, if you could introduce yourself to our listeners. Absolutely. So my name is Scott Amix. I'm the managed partner at Amix uh, Ventures based in New York City. So Scott, very nice to see you. Thanks very much for, for coming along. You have a, a very interesting background and, and certainly our listeners are going to get to understand very much more about you as we go through this particular session. But uh, I wanted to start just by highlighting that um, you are a committee member for the World Economic Forum for the Future of the Internet the Internet of Things being something that you're regarded as being one of the uh, leading authorities on. Perhaps you could explain what Internet of Things actually is and the impact that it is having in terms of the way that we live today. Thank you, Steve. Uh, one point of clarification is that I was nominated to the, uh, the committee, um, so that's one. In terms of the question around the Internet of Things, uh, it is one of those buzzwords, much like blockchain and cryptocurrencies, that's fairly uh, circulated uh, in society today. I think the, um, the way I would explain Internet of Things is in the context of larger, broader convergence of technologies within fourth industrial revolution. Generally, um, these exponential technologies do not necessarily work in a standalone fashion. They work in convergence with others. So in the case of Internet of Things, uh, the real value isn't just being able to quantify or provide uh, data on inanimate and animate objects, but it's the ability to then take that data, the three different Vs of data, and then be able to actually analyze it, uh, not just historically, but from a forward-looking perspective with predictive and prescriptive analytics. Internet of Things from a layman person, I would say, is something to do with the fact that uh, for most of our world, I would say a lot of it is pretty much offline. And it is literally digitizing um, things around us, everything from soil to being able to ascertain the weather conditions to even uh, things, objects that we're sitting or touching or interacting with on a daily basis. And as our environment becomes alive, um, and I hate to use this analogy of the matrix, in many ways, uh, the environment, the 3D vector environment, uh, as we, the primary actor, move about this geospatial location, becomes alive, and it starts to give us information and data. Uh, and that has huge implication, not only from an operational efficiency uh, and pr preventive maintenance, but also just society, that which we will get into as well. So the Internet of Things for the layperson is your wired coffee maker that delivers data about your usage into a digital space or your refrigerator or... Yes, uh, it, it could be just about anything, uh, you know, from your water bottle that has a smart cap that uh, measures how much volume of hmm. water you're drinking and whether you're hydrated, to a mouth guard in your, in your mouth as an athlete uh, that can actually detect uh, things like your heart rate, um, your moisture, uh, moisture dehydration level, as well as impact level, hmm. to uh, the sensors within the cars, autonomous vehicles and public transportation to the kinds of things that we're investing into, uh, startups and technologies that are enabling walls, windows, and surfaces to become alive and mm -hmm. measure and detect and capture data. Can we assume that that will be ubiquitous and that everything will be wired in the Internet of Things soon? Yes, and I think that's a great lead-in, which is that the benefit is that, yes, most everything, including at the nanotechnology, so we're talking about uh, potentially paint and even cosmetics, mm -hmm. Uh, all of these things will eventually have capability to actually transmit or have some radio frequency capabilities, uh, some of which doesn't even uh, need the traditional batteries, can be self-powered as well, uh, is that, uh, yes, the density of ubiquity will increase and it will be just kind of built inside. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's truly the Intel inside model where the clothes that we wear, the things that we put on, the things we interact with just will be connected. Um, but with that, there are also some adverse uh, externalities that we'll need to discuss as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that strikes me, Scott, is that the challenge, I guess, for, for a lot of people is actually coming to terms with what this might mean for them. I'm thinking in particular of some quite strong resistance that we're seeing in, in different parts of the world to things like smart metering. So as simple as, as that. Uh, and I think that some of the things that we're seeing around Facebook and some of the other breaches that, that have been in the press recently are just reinforcing 
to people the fact that, hang on a minute, you know, you're accessing my personal data. How do I know that you're going to be holding it securely? Are you responsible? Can I trust you? All of those sorts of things. Uh, and so how, how do you see us having, you know, being able to overcome some of those societal resistances, barriers, if you like? Yeah, let me uh, cover a little bit on the technical side, and then I'll opine a little bit on the on the societal impact. Uh, well, first of all, when we talk about kind of more mundane things like um, consumer goods, uh, Internet of Things goods that you can purchase for your home, uh, Amazon Echo Dot as an example, smart meters, uh, thermometers, and so forth, uh, is that um, the manufacturers are not necessarily incented to embed security functionalities or feature set or privacy into their stack. And that stack could be uh, at the SOC chip level, embedded chip, uh, crypto keys, uh, to the firmware, to over-the-air updates, to the protocols and standards that they're using. So it's a very haphazard still. And of course, there are a number of consortiums and alliances that are uh, currently in progress to solve not only interoperability, but a big part of that is the fundamental security flaw. Uh, we have seen uh, how hackers and um, bad country or na national agents are, in effect, using these masses of nodes uh, to be able to conduct widespread DDoS attacks, uh, as well as, in some cases, even start to use some of these uh, edge devices for computational purposes for mining cryptocurrencies, as mm -hmm. an example. Uh, so it is, uh, it is really open at the can of worms, so sort to of speak. And of course, from a consumer perspective, they're fairly naive. Um, some of it is intentional and some of it's kind of irrational. Uh, but the fact that they don't reset the default password, um, they don't necessarily update the firmware, there's a lot of things that they can do. For example, I was interviewed recently about Alexa and Google Assistant. And what can we do about our ability to actually remove the recordings? And I said, you know, one of the best way to do it is shut it off. If you're going to have a private conversation about something that's important, just completely shut it off. Uh, because if you think that you're uh, a room away and you think that you're not being recorded, you are. You potentially could be. There is a lot of noise, but with enough filtering and algorithms, you could signal process that and be able to ascertain potentially damaging information about you. You can actually see the script or the narration that's being recorded on these systems. And, of course, their position, whether it's Google or Amazon, is that we need to teach our uh, machine learning systems and we need to ingest all this data but the fact is, everything that you're, it's not just about some transaction about, I need to reorder toilet paper. It's that conversation. It's a heated conversation. It's that very private matter that's happening in the home and now actually in the businesses. So that was another interview that I did recently about Alexa for Business as well as Cisco products that's coming into the business where now it's going to be listening to your meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, there's a lot of benefit to automating video conferencing workflows, automating meeting setup and facilitation note-taking. But it just means that you really have to watch what you're saying and what you're doing because at any given point, you are giving off data and you're just a walking set of metadata and, and people are going to be using it and we have no idea how they're going to use it. Which brings up the topic of GDPR, which is, um, has been ratified two years ago, but now it's really becoming full impact uh, effect as of May 24th. So... There are counteracting forces, but at the same time, you still have the consumer, and the consumer is still fairly intentionally ignorant uh, for our purposes. And what that means is a big brother approach from the European Commission and adoption within the U.S. isn't necessarily going to protect you per se. Uh, so the thing is, if they want to access your information, they still can. They have ways to do that. Uh, now, uh, later tonight, I'm going to be talking about more advanced topics like homomorphic encryptions and um, you know, pairing of eclip ecliptic curves um, and, and even dash to some extent with the private, uh, private send as an example. Uh, but the point is that there are technologies that can help secure some of these things, but there is no perfect solution. Just like the articles that I read on your website, it, has to, it starts with the human. It starts with us, and we are our biggest risk. Mm -hmm. And it, it's our ability to not only trust, but also verify, as I think it was quoted as an example. So the key is we have to learn to self-educate ourselves, become informed, and make sure that we're making reasonable trade-off. And if we are not clear about the traceability, including through forms of different blockchains uh, and DAOs, we have to make sure that we become responsible agents and making sure that not only stewards of 
the organizations that we work for or the interactions that we have with others, but we need to make sure that we always have security in mind as just a way of thinking. You raise an interesting point about self-education, you know, self-learning. And for me, there is a, a, a dilemma because on the one hand, we have the manufacturers of devices whose intent is to make it as easy as possible for the end user. And so that means staying away from complexity, staying away from uh, touching perhaps on issues of security and, and, and so on. Um, and yet on the other hand, as you rightly point out, all of these devices are out there potentially listening. And so if you do want to have the private conversation, you do need to understand how to switch these things off. And therein for me lies the dilemma. The vast majority of people are probably still unaware. You know, when, when we look at home routers would, would be a, a good example. You know, the advice from a security professional would always be change the password on the router as soon as it's been installed because it'll be a factory setting and, and change it to something that's, that's memorable or at least change it. Uh, and if necessary, write it down and put the password in your in your safe or somewhere that uh, where you can access it. Um, yet, very many people don't even understand that. So when we start talking about you know uh, self education, where do we start? My own view is that it, it's probably a generational thing. It will come through from the schools and so on, but that means it's going to take a very very long time. So how can we fast track that? Uh, well, first of all, I'm originally from Silicon Valley, and one of the things that uh, certainly millennials and those that are somewhat uh, technically apt is um, if you look at their phones or their laptops, one of the first key uh, is going to be that they'll put a um, sticker or something that covers the camera because they know mm -hmm. that any, uh, including government agencies, can access your machines, in some cases even if it's powered off. So just being mindful and being aware of that, uh, and if you're going to be taking a shower, uh, there are people that actually watch YouTube in the shower, as an example. And you'd be surprised <laughs> mm -hmm. you're actually broadcasting information that you may not be aware of. Uh, so really being mindful to separate the devices from certain activities and you know, just making sure you have some distance around that. I just want to interject and say the <laughs> listeners can't see my gesture. But when you say <laughs> even when it's off that we can be recorded, that's dismaying to me. I mm -hmm. think most people would never imagine that. Well, you know, there's a little bit of a kind of a secret in the sense that you have Incutel as well as DARPA and these kind of military or government-led initiatives that are 10, 20 years ahead. So many of the commercialization or the things that we use, we take for granted today, were really researched and developed and funded by the government 10, 20 years ago. Hmm. Uh, and part of that is Incutel is a good example. A lot of these entities will also put uh, capital into companies like Uber and other companies, not just for commercial return, but they want to make sure there is a way to have backdoor access uh, to be able to get data uh, into the masses. Mm. Uh, so that's th that's something that does a constant conflict between the likes of Apple and the government and, of course, privacy hawks and so forth. That was the first part of our conversation with Scott Amex, managing partner at Scott Amex Ventures and author of the forthcoming book, The Human Race. How Humans Can Survive in the Robotic Age. We hope you enjoyed hearing his perspective on the future of the Internet of Things. Be sure to catch our next episode, which will feature part two of our interview with Scott, where we delve into the topic of artificial intelligence and the future of the global economy. And, of course, to find more resources and information on the Internet of Things and hear more conversations with ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin on a host of helpful topics, please visit securityforum.org.